Good morning, Lou Paul. Good morning, Ajahn Soko, Ajahn Apamada. So thank you for taking some time to do another Q&A. Today is the Saturday, the 29th of April, 2023. And I was hoping you could say a few words about something you've been mentioning the last few years, talking about the Noble Eightfold Path. You uh, sometimes refer to right effort as no effort. How did you come to that? Well, there's, uh, the ego is conditioned by effort, you know, so you, when, you, when you're contemplating the ego, the sense of a separate self, then you, you know, that takes some kind of effort. You have to think and, um, and remember and get caught up in the uh, sun cars or the phenomena that you have about yourself as having to do something or get something you don't have. And then uh, insight into the Eightfold Path is Samawayamo, which is uh, right effort. And so the word effort itself becomes uh, kind of redundant because actually right effort is is no effort. It's a relaxed state of being here and now. Now if you try to be here and now through effort, then you have to put some kind of tension into the body. You have to think, you have to try to become and practice right effort is just these kind of words mean uh, that you're you're operating from you you've got to get something you don't have but right effort is natural it's not it's not a created sense of I have to do something or get something but just letting go relaxing being present here and now and then because of the Dhamma is here and now, timeless. And what kind of effort can you apply to, to timelessness or being here and now? Because we are here and now just naturally. <laughs> and and uh, with, with no effort, we're here and now. So for, like some people would probably argue that that's a kind of a, an advanced practice and that beginners need to put forth effort to overcome defilements and let go of unwholesome states and cultivate wholesome states. You know, the classic definition of the four types of right effort. Right, well in the, because ignorance or avicca of Dhamma means that we we have to, we see meditation as something we have to do. We see ourselves as imperfect, as, you know, we become critical. We can see all kinds of weaknesses and we have fear and anger and, and um, emotions that we strongly identify with. And we want to, you know, the idea is to be fearless and, and full of loving kindness. And so these are the messages you get from religious uh, in conditioning. And it's good, you know, it's not wrong. But it, it you know, eventually you see through it that, that uh, Dhamma is perfect and it's here and now, timeless. So there's, there's nothing you have, you have, you know, the idea that you have to get it and, and do something to, to become enlightened is still Sakya Diti or the ego operating from the conditioning that individuals identify with. 
So in the beginning stages, usually you start by doing something like mindfulness of the breath, or <clears throat> the, and so because it's you know the breath is is something that uh, go, is quite natural, and it's here and now. It's it's time bound because you can only inhale so far and you have to exhale. <laughs> But uh, it gives somebody something to do, or a mantra. Uh, Using mantras uh, can be quite uh, skillful. But eventually, you realize that this sense of having to do something, chant a mantra, watch the breath, get samadhi, uh, all good advice. But it is advice that we see in through the personal identity with the body. And through investigation of Dharma, through we like with Pasana, it really amounts to investigating experience here and now. And by observing suffering, understanding suffering. Uh, you know, you just by starting from the first noble truth, you it leads you on to uh, the second noble truth is letting go of everything. So when you let go of everything, is is that an effort? Or, you know, is it getting rid of everything, or do we use effort to let go of the, the advice for the second noble truth? Let go. Of, Sankaras, that go of phenomena, or is letting go just uh, uh, you know the not creating tensions, relaxing. Lumpa Cha called meditation holiday of the heart. I remember being uh, because when I first met him, I was very much into doing meditation, trying to get concentration and get rid of kilesas, because that's my personality's condition to to try to get something or get rid of things I don't like, by controlling. And, uh, and then the uh, witnessing of that, eventually, as you reflect on suffering, not try to get rid of it. At first, you know, the ego just wants to get rid of suffering. We don't like it. We don't want it. But then, uh, that's not the point of getting rid of it. It's understanding it. And that's made very clear. And then letting go of the causes of suffering is letting, seeing the desires that we identify with. Like sensual desire is very strong. It's a very sensual experience. Uh, being having human form, having eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and it's all very sensual, and and it's very real to us that we have to experience our experiences is through this this sensitivity that we identify with and cling to and try to perfect or get rid of or change or improve or whatever because the sensual experiences are impermanent. And you can't, you know, life can't be just beautiful and happy. You know, that's what we'd like. The ego wants to be permanently happy and have permanent bliss and beauty, and that's heaven. So we can, you know, try to go to heaven, try to prevent ourselves from going to hell by being very moral, very uh, proper, obeying all the rules, all the laws, all the precepts, and, uh, but still this, the ego is is involved in it. I've got to obey the laws, the precepts. I've got to become pure. I am impure. I have impure thoughts or desires. 
So then uh, Bhavadana, or you know, that lists these three kinds of desire. Bhavadana is a desire to become. So you you desire to become enlightened. Even this very noble desire for the ego is a very noble desire to to want to develop and live a spiritual life being moral and good and kind and full of love and attain enlightenment, that's very noble. <clears throat> so it's, you know, it's, it's the attachment to these noble desires that is the cause of suffering. Because life isn't beautiful all the time. You know, it has moments and uh, just like seeing, observing. You know, we have to, we can see flowers, but we also have to see feces, which is ugly. And so, so and uh, there's so many things we have to live with, see that is ugly and unpleasant, uh, as well as what is beautiful. So, essential world is to be reflected upon with wisdom, not with idealism, because the sensual world, his very nature, is imperfect. It changes. It can't sustain itself in a perfect state. And so this is this kind of wise reflection on the way it is and we begin to see even our desires to become enlightened are to let go of those, to try to get something you don't have, which is very noble and very good, but it is a desire and it's based on ignorance, not on wisdom, where wisdom knows that uh, all conditions are impermanent. And uh, that's their nature. Conditioned phenomena can only be what it is. And its very essence is, is this changingness, impermanence, which we can contemplate. The contem rather than just trying to see life as beautiful and wonderful and full of love, we, we can observe. The, the feeling of beauty as, as, as a feeling that comes and goes according to conditions. And then Vipavadhanma, the third form of desire, is a get rid of, you know, wanting to get rid of anger, or jealousy, or fear. And these are also quite noble, to get rid of the defilements. Um, get rid of lust and greed and selfishness. So Vipavadana, or desire to get rid of, is also, uh, you know, can be quite noble to destroy what is ugly and imperfect and undesirable. Uh, and, uh, but it's still a desire which is a cause of suffering. So just by reflecting on the cause of suffering is clinging to these desires, not the desires, they're not, they make their phenomena that come and go, conditions that arise and cease according to other conditions. But it's clinging to these three forms of desire that is the cause of suffering and the insight is to let go of desire. It's not to annihilate desire, because that's still the ego. To get rid of desire, annihilate it, is still the, I've got to get rid of desire. And when we reflect on the sensory experience that we're living with, in these bodies, and these forms, is that uh, they're desire forms. They're made out of desire. The eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, mind is all about desire to become, to get rid of, to control, to have power. 
uh, you know, and so that it, it uh, these, the, we have to live with, and the, you know, we have to live this in this form for its lifespan. But to understand it is wisdom, that the form is not self. It's not what you are. You're not a human body. You're not a desire uh, or uh, whatever, whether it's good desires or bad desires, you're none of that. You're not greed, hatred or delusion of any sort. Then what are you? You know, so you, you know, if you, the ego wants to find out what I really am, what my true nature is. So when you let go of these three kinds of desire, there's nothing left to grasp. There's still, I still see and it is still here and the nose still smells and tongue, and tongue still tastes and on and on like that. But it's, it's witness to and with wisdom rather than with ignorance. So how do you reconcile the right effort is no effort with the effort to understand, the effort to contemplate Dhamma, to investigate, to develop the wisdom? Because the practice is a path from ignorance to understanding, from clinging to letting go. I'm just playing the devil's advocate here, because in terms of semantics, no effort sounds like you're not doing anything, and yet it's, it's not quite Well, right. even uh, not doing anything is doing something. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if I'm not going to put any for, I'm not going to put any effort into life. It's still the ego, you know. That's where it's trusting in awareness. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's natural, it's not creative. It's not me trying to not put an effort into life as an ego, but it's a, a, a sense of relaxed attentiveness to the experience that we have through the senses, non-judgmental, not judging them, not getting caught up with preferring one condition over another, uh, believing in the, in all the gossip and problems of our societies or our families, and recognizing that the world is the way it is, because it, it's about uh, well, karma, it's the condition, the conditioning that we identify with that is the cause of suffering. But if we live with the unconditioned, if we abide in awareness, which isn't conditioned, then we witness the conditions and uh, we're not attached to the conditions, so we don't suffer from them. Whatever we have to experience through the remainder of our lives, through the, the bodies that, we, that exist, in the, until they pass away. So this uh, notion of no effort is really bringing us back to a more intuitive relationship to awareness rather than a thinking one. Like to be here now, you don't have to put any effort in there. And to let go of conditions it's just like relaxing. Like I don't have to get rid of my hands. If I'm forming a fist, that takes effort, doesn't it? That's an effort that you say, relax, let go. I'm not going to cut off my hand. I just like, relax it. Be, let it be as it is in the present. So yeah, this is the problem with language, is it's, it's dualistic. It's, it's about right and wrong, good and bad, yes and no. And, uh, and that's the ego is based on those 
terminologies on good and bad, male and female, right and wrong. And so they, that, you know, these are endless problems uh, in, in society. Husband and wife, nation and in, nationality and internationality and, and uh, communism and democracy and, and uh, autocracy and oligarchy. And, they're all words in the English lexicon, but they are, you know, we, we cling to these words. But we don't realize we're clinging. We become obsessed with, with political views of right and left, liberal or conservative. And uh, we, we, we don't know we're clinging, but we become very righteous or obsessed or intolerant through the clinging to to these words, these empty words that we give our life for. You know, we can sacrifice our life for some noble cause, fight for democracy or freedom uh, is, uh, you know, we're willing to sacrifice ourselves for freedom, which is, is a noble idea. But with seeing things as they really are by abiding in Dhamma, that's freedom. It's natural freedom. It's not something you fight for, not something you'll ever get through fighting for it. But the words we have is we've got to get rid of uh, dictatorships and injustices and autocrats and on and on like that. We've got to have equal rights and freedom for all equal and fair, just and good, moral and <clears throat> right. And uh, that's still thinking, that's one extreme that we might dedicate our lives for, for the extremities of, of goodness and righteousness. But, you know, we're, we still suffer from that because we, we feel threatened by the opposite, by if you're on the left, you feel threatened by the right. If you cling to the ideal of democracy, you feel threatened by communism or fascism. These are the words that people use to describe their enemy or what's bad. If you believe in God, then, then anyone who doesn't believe in God is bad, is evil, is going to hell. The whole is logical. You know, the, the dualistic thinking is very logical and, reason, and it can be reasonable, but it's also very blinding because thoughts, ideals are impermanent. They're very, they can't sustain themselves. And this witnessing, this witnessing of impermanence is not, you know, is, is it doesn't take an effort to witness it. You don't have to put forth an effort to just observe the way it is at this moment it's like this. And then if you see this moment as good, then you want it to, you want the whole day to be good. And you see somebody who spoils your day as bad, so you're caught in this, in these dualistic opposites and you're, you're subject to all kinds of things you have no control over. Like living in a monastic community, can you get along with everybody and be friendly and full of love and metta, you know, through experience as a person? 
Because even in a, a, a sangha, a monastic community such as ours here in Amravati, there's still personal conflicts and misunderstandings, and somebody somebody kind of attacks you or argues with you can upset you when you're in a state of loving kindness for all creatures, and then suddenly some monk confronts you in a way that you feel angry and you can't you can't sustain I love everybody when you're angry. But you can witness anger when the conditions for anger arise. You're not blind to it. You're not living in a in a bubble of goodness. Because that's not possible. That's uh, that's an idea that would be nice, but it's not the way life is for any of us. So one more question, if I may, just in terms of, because you bring up these examples of kind of daily life, as we experience in the monastery, but then also just in, in uh, lay life, very often people, like what, what would you say to a mother, for example, who's raising children they reach their teenage period where they're very challenging and stuff. How is right effort, no effort there when you need, need for, for example, to set boundaries? Or in a society where there might be injustices and people often ask, yeah, but if you do nothing, then everybody suffers. You've got to do something. So how do we position ourselves in terms of right and effort? Effort is no effort in circumstances like those. Well, with no effort, there's spontaneity. You, you respond to conditions as you experience them. So, you know, a mother with a naughty teenage daughter, <laughs> you know, there's, there's nothing I can do, just give up, <laughs> just let her, you know, that's still the ego. But, uh, reflect on how you, you don't want your daughter to be naughty. And when she is, then you get upset. You can witness that. And you can give good instruction, about, like precept, moral precept, sila, uh, loving, having metta or loving kindness for all beings and and obeying the rules and be, being a credit to the family, you can still say, say things, but it's more spontaneous than than uh, condition to dump a trip on your son or daughter. Because what children suffer is by parents who want want to control their children, make them into what the ideal they have. They want their son to be like this, be successful, daughter to become somebody important or get a good husband or marry or <clears throat> become a nun or, <laughs> you know, all, you know, we want our sons and daughters to be good and successful, but we can be a witness to that, wanting somebody else to be what, what I want them to be is like this. And uh, then you, you can let go of your family. It doesn't mean you, you run off to a cave and live by yourself, but you're certainly not trying to project onto your mates or your partners or your children, uh, all kinds of uh, ideas that you, you think they should be. Because we each have our separate karmas, our karmas are different. And, uh, you know, the, the conditioned realm is about, not about equality, but about inequality. Things are changing. <clears throat> So conditions can't be fair, permanently fair, or just. 
or why? Because uh, condition phenomena is, is is its very nature is incessant, relentless changingness. Like you, like this Sunday morning here at Amravati, we'd like to have Sunday morning, uh, a Sunday morning like this, to be, you know, during a dreary winter in England. You wish that England could be sunny and spring all year round, but it can't be. The weather in England is like this. It has four seasons. And and, uh, and when we want wintertime to be springtime, we suffer. But if we don't project onto winter any I, uh, wish to make it into springtime, then we can appreciate winter because it's different. It's a different, what we see is different than what we see right now in the springtime. And when we suffer if we don't want winter to be like that or summer or the seasons, we want them, we'd like a permanent, permanent spring. But then, you know, living in Thailand, <laughs> For years, you get tired of the heat, and you can be averse to heat, and and remember springtime in England. Then you then you're suffering from uh, the heat in Thailand, where you can witness your own aversion to to. The, a hot day in Thailand, you can even witness it, but you can't change it because that's its nature to be like that. Thailand's a tropical country, England is a northern European country, and you know, so they don't have the same karma. And, are, you know, like wanting monks or nuns to, you know, we want them to be exemplary, to keep all the precepts, to be grateful for the four requisites, to with all kinds of noble advice. When you enter the Sangha, we want them to have faith in Buddha Dhamma, become good Buddhists, practice meditation, and uh, to support what I think they should support. To be grateful for me, to me for bringing Dhamma to them, <laughs> and all the sense of, of uh, you know, all the shoulds of what you you would like monks and nuns to that come and have, that you ordain or you give the precepts to. But then when you witness that, you see it, it's the ego wanting everybody to be like me, to, to conform to what the ideals that I cling to. It, they can't do it. It's not that they're stubbornly refusing, but they can't do it because they've got separate karmic tendencies. They have different backgrounds, different nationalities different expectations, different generations. So we're not carbon copies of the same condition, but that's, that's where all the differences exist, is in the changing realm of samsara, or the world, the, uh, the sensual world that we experience through the body. So the aim of the Buddha Dhamma is to recognize your true nature is Dhamma, which is perfect already, pure, never, it's, it can't be stained, it can't be corrupted, and it's here and now, timeless, and it's not personal. And that is a realization that comes through letting go of sankharas, of conditions. You can't form, make conditions into idea, you know, permanent ideals.
Thank you very much for this one.